Hello, hello. Everybody, good afternoon, wherever you are. Hey, y'all. I'm going to be going live in a second with a new acquaintance of mine, a really intelligent cat named uh, Conscious Lee. We're going to have a little discussion. I'm going to look forward to uh, talking. Let's see. My brother, hey. What's going on, man? Hey, sir. I'm so excited for this, man. Oh yeah, I'm definitely excited. I'm 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 yeah, I'm 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 greatly excited. Education is elevation, man. To everybody that's about to watch this conversation that we about to have, I just ask you to come in with it open minded and that you filter all your life experiences to what we're about to talk about, you feel me? Because it's about to be some real shit that we're about to get, get into and explore and unpack it, man. I absolutely love this. So, so those of you on my side that are watching, you know, I started following uh, Conscious Lee on TikTok during the, uh, during the uh, lockdown. And I was so inspired by the words that this brother had to say. And here, here is the reality. And this is where I hope I don't lose some of you, but where I'm completely open to the fact that I may lose some of you right now, that this talk is about race. Now, what I've noticed is there, there's a certain segment of the population that as soon as race starts, we say, hey, let's discuss race. They go, oh, I'm not talking about this again. Race is so divisive and you're breaking our country in half and all I wanna do is to be entertained. Well, I got some news for you. In case you didn't notice, I happen to be a, a melanin compacted man, black, and black is the day that I was born until the day that I die. That, that doesn't define me wholly, nor does it define consciously or, or anybody else watching. But I think to run away from an important conversation that has shown that there is a schism in this country, that there are things that we need to address. And uh, so my brother decided to, uh, to talk to me so we can have this this uh, discussion and what, what I love about the talk and I'm gonna let, let Lee jump, jump in and lead it is part of what I've always led with from the time that I was a child is I've always felt othered. And for, for those of you that know what I'm talking about, it's weird to feel othered within a group of people, black people that, that are othered. So when you feel like you don't fit in to your own tribe, when you don't fit into other black people because some people will go, oh, well, you're not like us. You don't fit this paradigm you you don't fit into this box the trauma that causes so i've dealt with that my entire life and i've dealt with it in art and i've dealt with it in certain things that that i've said and so having this conversation with him about what does it mean to be black it's not a monolithic thing and especially being a man being a black man and the toxic masculinity that can go along with it i've had to also deal with that in my life. I have a beautiful daughter, so I'm trying to educate myself and to make myself not just a better black person, but a better man in general, so I don't pass on that trauma. And I feel that trauma is responsible for a lot of age, responsible for things that we've done before black
Hey man, I'm so sorry. I think my my uh my internet took 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 a crap on me for a second. Huh? You got that Teddy Riley internet over there? Man. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Teddy Riley came up and said my my that 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 that's 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 so fucking stupid. I'm so sorry. Uh, I I hope that it's gonna work now. Oh man, like we lost half of our folks. They'll yeah, they'll no, we gonna they gonna, they gonna come back though. They gonna they, they gonna come back. You know what I'm saying? They, they, they definitely gonna come back, man. We definitely gotta uh, uh, make sure we get this uh, saved as well. You know what I'm saying? Because it's about yes, to sir. be a good conversation. Um, I wanna start this off by saying I recognize that a lot of times us as black people don't want to have conversations about pain and hurt and trauma inside of our community because we see how it get pathologized and used against us. You know what I'm saying? But for full transparency, this is how I started, right? I'm on TikTok, you feel me? And I duet this video about this black dude that identifies as a quote unquote black nerd. And he's talking to other black men that identify as a black nerd saying, we got to let go of our hurt and let go of what black, we got to let go of what we went through in middle school and high school because it wasn't that black women didn't like us because we were nerds, so black women like us because X, Y, and Z, right? This black therapist by the name of Derek, he goes by the, he goes by the name of situational therapist, interjected in the conversation, and he started talking about disvalidating experiences, and he read this quote from Dr. Stacy Patton from the book, Spare the Child, where she talks about black men needing spaces to be able to talk about our hurt, our pain and our trauma without it being seen as a way of trivializing our masculinity or seen as us just merely blaming black men, I mean, uh, blaming, blaming women. Now, I ain't gonna cap. When situational therapists first respond to my video, I definitely want to come in and I'm like, nah, bro. Yeah, bro, niggas go through trauma and pain, you feel me? But we can't weaponize that against all black women. And there were also black women that identify and made fun of for the same things you were made fun of. But I thought what, what, what what's important and the conversation is, as a black man, I identify with Stacey, what Dr. Stacey Patton was talking about. And I think situational therapists open my eyes into being able to, I feel like, be more reflective about how trauma in our community operates, especially when it's for black people that are seen as not being black enough, quote unquote. And I think that there's mm -hmm. a lot to unpackage there. There's so much to unpack there because... Here is the thing, what does that actually mean? And I've had this conversation for years. And you know, when I first first got on, you know, that, that I'd already been acting for, uh, for 10, 11 years before I got Who's Line. And before that happened, and before I was on a national stage, I was always free to just do whatever role came my way because I was just a journeyman actor and doing this. And of course, you have the little piece, pieces of racism that hit you because I'm from, from Florida. so. I'm used to it, but it wasn't until I got on TV and I noticed that people made their mind up. Either they were like, you know, like uh, other black folks were like, I'm so happy to see one of us on TV being funny, making me laugh in this situation and with, with these three other white guys and whatnot. I just saw guys on stage being funny and doing whatever came up in the situation to be funny. It wasn't until a couple of years down the road when, when I heard, you know, when the whole Chappelle thing came, it came up, the Chappelle sketch, when I took, took a step and said, why am I being seen like that? And I took offense at it because I, like a lot of people, I am black, but I define myself in a myriad of ways. I, I define myself by what I do. I define myself as a father. I define myself in all these ways. And as soon as one of our people say, you're not black enough, then what does that mean? That means that I don't live up to something. Or that means that I'm not man enough in your way. Just, just because I don't, you know, I'm not a thug in your mind. It means that I'm, I'm soft, I'm this and whatever. And I really had to think about that. And for years, that caused me a lot of pain. And, and then through therapy, I had to go back and realize that's from my childhood. My folks are from the Virgin Islands, so I, so I had a very thick accent growing up. So I was made fun of because of my accent or because they thought that I talked too proper or because I liked Mon, Mon, Monty Python and I liked hip hop. I, I couldn't like all these things. I, I was in the gifted program and you talk this way and you blah, blah, blah. All that shit caught up with me until I realized that I was walking around with rage. And I'll admit, I, I am, my, my friends kid me about it, 
I'm a fairly angry person. And this is one of the first times I've said this. And, and I'm not even saying that to be funny. Um, yeah. Oh, uh, Lee, um, I've got to send you this thing that I did at the, uh, at the Lincoln Center. It's on Spotify right now. It's called, um, it's part of a spoken word piece. It's called The Angriest Black Man in America or How I Love to Forgive Myself. And it's a, and it's a whole piece describing an, an incident uh, that I had when I was a kid, but I just thought about it because I said, it said angry. I, I'm fairly angry. And I was, where does that come from? Because what people see on TV, oh, you're smiling, you're this and da 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 da. And then that becomes a thing. It's like, well, Wayne is soft because Wayne smiles and Wayne laughs and jokes for the white people. And Wayne doesn't do this and Wayne doesn't do that. All I'm doing is entertaining and doing what I do. I didn't realize that everybody had so many opinions about it. So it took me a lot of therapy to get to a place where I had to talk to that trauma. Yeah. And when I look at other folks like you and I look at cats like Key and Peel yeah. and, and, then, and I look at Dave and I look at Kevin Hart, it's a myriad of us talking about our, our experiences. But if we keep presenting to the world, this is what it means to be black. You got to be the star of a rap video and talk like this and got bitches and da 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 da, then we're doing ourselves a disservice because it's also the there's a white dude that stands behind us and goes, yeah. you're right. That's See? what black is. I've had a director. I will say this shit out loud. I've never said it, but I was cast in Snakes on a Plane. Now, not the world's greatest movie, but I wanted that role so badly. And a buddy of mine, Flex Alexander, did it and killed it. I went all out for that audition. I had this whole thing and I went in, I freestyled the rap. I, would, I knocked them off their feet. The director said, Wayne, I want you. Came back to me through my agent that the head of the studio at that time, I believe it's Toby Emmerich. He said, Wayne Brady is not black enough to play this role. So I was defined third party by someone else who doesn't look like me. But because of a stereotype that we've set up, there is a litmus test for us. So... Yeah, yeah, see, and I think that I can't. I, I think that I come at it from the other perspective of being, being, being some people. I like being a person that was younger that only experienced the bullying from, I guess, other black people. You know what I'm saying? When it, I thought it was more of a class thing. You know what I'm saying? Like I dressed yeah. a certain way. It was more of a class thing, and sometimes with education. But I recognized at a certain point in like high school, I became accepted amongst the other popular black kids. You feel me? And I get to, I got to contribute to the bullying, the ostracizing, the alienating. You feel me? And I was the you know I'm I was the only kid from the hood that sat in the AP honors classes that got to see the other black kids, the other middle class black kids weaponize they non-likeness of, of stereotypical black shit against me. It made me look crazy. It made me, you feel me? And I think that the reason why this conversation is so, I feel like crucial and difficult to have because I think there's a lot of internalization of resentment, you feel me, that happens on a lot of the sides when it comes to just black folks. You see what I'm saying? I think that when it comes to like black people that's like from the hood, quote unquote, or that speaks a particular way, I think that we see a, 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 a certain appeal to whiteness and white people that we're kind of envious of and or want to criticize. You see what I'm saying? And I think that just uh, being a younger black man, you know what I'm saying, from the hood or whatever, I see you feel me? And recognize that type of desire to want to give those type of criticisms. You see that? Does it make sense? That makes complete sense. That's, oh, like, it's like, I know your complete story because I've walked in those shoes. Being, yeah. being the only kid, there was myself and another dude named Artis Woodard. And from kindergarten, we were bused from our hood to this other white school across town. And so I grew up in the gifted program in Dr. Phillips. All, all through those years. So going back and forth between those two worlds, you end up seeing, just, just like you're saying, and you end up seeing the appeal. And this is the part that I was angry about, that, that I realized that I was mad. Because I was, I was seen as safe by the kids because, oh, so you're being bust here, so you must be smart. And that lasted up to high school when I'm the only black dude in the AP class and you're sitting down. Then the mind, then the thing that ends up happening is, and I'm ashamed to say this, but I've, but I realized that I started to be angry at my blackness because if my other black people were telling me that I was a certain way and these guys seemed to accept me, 
at the at at the expense of them making black jokes or whatever, then I then I went through a phase where I was like, yeah, you know what? I, I understand now. That's why black is bad, or that's why this is. And that's a mind screw. It's so horrible to have internalize. internalized hate. You end up hating yourself. And that is the strongest hate because if you hate yourself, you have nothing to lose when, when you go out in the world. And, and I, I feel like that, that to me, the reason why this conversation, I feel like has to be had a lot more throughout our communities because I think that the healing that has to take place from it, because you know, like drastic times call for drastic measures. Shit, hurt people, hurt people. So it's like if you don't feel like nobody identify with you or love you and you don't, you know what I'm saying, it's not going to make you want to heal from your inner child. Cause that's what I recognize as a 30 year old now. You see what mm. I'm saying? I recognize now that I've tricked myself, my adult self a long time into ignoring all the shit I went through as a child to say, nah, I overcame man. I did this, that, and the other. And I was ignoring though how I still was carrying a lot of scars, a lot of pain, a lot of hurt from different things, different folks told me and or different experiences I had. And that's the reason why that Dr. Stacey Patton quote from her book, Spirit of Child, that's about child rearing and about, you know what I'm saying, uh, uh, whoopings and, and child abuse. She said something specifically to black men that spoke to our trauma and hurt and it made me realize that though I wanted to come at him and think about, hey, there's still no justification for black men to be able to weaponize our pain and trauma against black women. You feel me? But it mm -hmm. doesn't also have to be recognizing too that there is this pain come from somewhere. It didn't come out the sky. It didn't come out the ground. It came from somewhere. And it's thinking about what you're gonna do with that. How do you? How do we as a community reflect on this 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 intercommunal conflict violence that we've had that's lasted for so long? Because I'm also being critical and acknowledging there's a history of black men us being able to weaponize and or project our hurt onto black women from the plantation through re reconstruction from you know what i'm saying sharecropping all the way to the war on drugs you see what i'm saying and i think that mm -hmm. that's why I, that's why i wanted to respond to him from but you see these two things that i'm dealing with right here that's very heavy yeah it's like what are we gonna do about it we we have such building to do because if we are to have this conversation and we talk about the truck, man, there's so much to you to unpack as I listen to you. Um, I think first off, if we, if we as black people in general can understand that our journeys are different and we are multifaceted and, and how amazing that is and we lift each other up that way, so if we can eliminate from our language how when a dude from, you know, from one neighborhood thing, thinks that a dude is a herb and or he's square and this and that or, did, or we bring each other down like that. If we can eliminate that and just go, OK, whatever your hustle is and wherever you're coming from and maybe your, your hustle is an academic hustle, maybe you're hustling, hustling, maybe your hustle is a plumbing job. If we can support each other's hustles and we gang up like this, then we can free ourselves from the external yeah. push that yeah. makes us act the way that we do. Oh, yeah. And, and I love what you said about the childhood piece. I'm writing this show right now called Young, Gifted, and Whack about growing up in my neighborhood. And I came up with the idea a few years ago when I first started therapy. And I had to go away to do therapy for about a week because I was in a not great place. And I laughed at this doctor when she sat down and, and she said, you know, you, you have to talk to your inner child. And one of the, the exercises was to write a letter to your child. I fell back on the training that I received as a kid growing up in Tangelo Park, where I was like, you know what, this is bullshit. This therapy stuff is bullshit. And talking to my inner child, I'm a grown ass man. What am I gonna tell? And I had to break through all of that stuff until I realized if I could go back in time and parent that Wayne and tell him, don't internalize this. Talk about these things. Un understand that your intrinsic worth is not wrapped up in all of these things. Then I feel that I would be a better man. And we could all benefit from going back and parenting that kid. 
I agree. I agree. Whole. I. I mean, I have a five year old and a three year old, and I wish that I was thinking more about my inner child and thinking more about the trials and tribulations I went through as a kid and how it would impact how I raised my kids. I wish I would have thought about that way more deeper because I would have went. I would. I would have took more of the time. You feel me? I think mm. that in our community, we have to. I feel like I'm almost trying to make therapy cool. Because a lot of us think that we can pray it away or we can sleep it away. And a lot of the stuff that we have to work through, it it, 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 it requires, you feel me? You know, in our community, we say take a village to raise a kid. Shit, yeah. take a village to deal with your inner child, too. You feel me? And I think that mm. going to the therapist, going to therapy is one of those ways in how we do it. But I also recognize that there there, there has to be, I feel like, a, a, a outside of therapy thing we do. You feel me? Like how I put it, it's a multiplicity of blackness and black folks. You feel mm. me? Like some of us like to rap and sing, but some of us is into, you know what I'm saying, a, a computer programming and into engineering. And I feel like having a conversation with you, Wayne, you made me realize that I'm so conditioned by the black aesthetic and expectations that I will unconsciously limit what black can be and what black can do without even trying to. I feel like when you said, when I said black nerd and I talked about hip hop and I started talking about these different things, you started, I feel like you went back, and I know this too. I know it. I know this shit. Why ain't you said, but 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 rock, rock music and pop music come for black people. It's just got taken away from us. So I'm thinking of the ways in which a lot of the times the history and how it happens or how it gets told and make it where we can pathologize people for like, oh, you in the pop music? That's that white shit. You in the rock music? That's that white shit. It's like, whoa, hold on there. That's anti blackness. You are trying to give a production that's that was curated through blood, sweat, and tears by black folks. The label of black folks, you're trying to attribute it to somebody else. Mm. I ain't, I feel like I, I took it that deep when you said, when you corrected me. I took it that deep, like, damn, conscious, damn, consciously, how conscious of you, my brother. We, yeah, but that's, that's to be expected because it's just what we're inundated with, not just on the daily, but over the course of your lifetime. That's what we're inundated with. We forget the things that we as a culture have brought. So if we forget the roots and the genesis of it, and then it's just the end result of, then that's why a brother can say to another brother, you like country, you like rock, you like pop, you like this. I feel, feel very, very lucky that I grew up in a household that because my folks are from St. Thomas and St. Croix, that their expectation of blackness was different than the American blackness. So in my household, I grew up listening to every music un, under the sun from soca and reggae to show tunes to old classics. And so that's why all of the culture, the media that I grew up with was also mixed media in a way. So I had a worldview even as a kid. And I was told, told at a certain point that my worldview was bad. But I was thinking, why is my worldview bad? Just because I'm not saying that I love all country music, but even at an early age, I knew that we started country music, so I was proud yeah. of where it started. So I ain't why know wouldn't that. I want to know all those things? Why, why wouldn't we know that country is an offshoot of gospel, which is an offshoot of our tribal songs and, and our work songs? Why wouldn't I be proud of that? When I was a junior in high school and started acting, I got turned on to R.E.M. and to this whole alt-rock scene. Yeah. My, my friends looked at me like I was crazy, but I could recognize the rhythms in that music that still move me. And which is why later I could take all those lessons and use them on stage later. So I never wanted to limit myself. And that's what I think. I think we have the opportunity to be superheroes. And when we limit ourselves by putting a label on ourselves and going, nah, man, that's not black enough. You're this. We, we, we are taking away our powers. So we, we need to endow each other with these powers again so oh, that we can be proud. Oh, and I think that we have to do that because we've already, you and I on the phone, we acknowledge the impact to when we try to, the word I, I want to use is authenticate someone's blackness. When you try to police someone's blackness, when you tell them the black they're not black enough. This right here ignores the multiplicity of blackness and black people. And I believe it perpetuates white supremacy because white supremacy wants us to believe that it's only one way to be black strong, uh, this, that, and the other. And I think that when we start talking about what that means for like black men in terms of masculinity, I think that we start to internalize a lot of that macho, toxic shit because you start to think about, damn, am I man enough? 
I'm into this, so I'm into that. And I think that that's a, a, a part of thinking about when somebody gonna tell you you ain't black enough. That's not black. I'm mostly thinking of if you are a white person, if you are a non-black person and you're watching this right now, just to make sure we dropping a little jewel in this because education is elevation, right? Right. When you hear black people having intercommunal conversations and we're talking about coons and Uncle Toms, we gonna we have to unpackage that relate that, that, that conversation for ourselves. But there is no reason for a non-black person to call another black person a coon or Uncle Tom, regardless of how much you disagree with them. The example I'm gonna use is Candace Owens. I disagree with damn near everything that woman says. However, I do not think that no non-black person should never, ever, ever call her Uncle Tom or you know what I'm saying, or a coon. Stay in your lane. You feel me? And to make sure I'm still going and contextualizing with education, I'm an ally of the LGBT community. You feel me? I know what to stay in my lane and when to shut up and when to sit back. If people in the, if trans women are having a conversation about disclosure, my cisgender voice is not needing that conversation. Mm. So just like that, you feel me? That it also should be copied and pasted and applied to when you see black people having conversations about what's happening inside of our community. Because you saying that is racist as hell. Me trying to police or say when a trans woman should disclose, disclose that's transphobic. You see what I'm getting at there? Inside the community, outside the community. And just want to make sure that we understand. Because I know me and Wayne having a conversation with two black men. You see what I'm saying? And just want to make sure I know that you have a lot of non-black people that follow you. I don't have non-black people that follow me. I want to make sure with clarity this conversation is being understood with that. You feel me? And I think this is a time and place to be able to let that be said. And that's a beautiful thing to say because even when someone is trying to help, that is a problem if you cross, cross that line. But the flip side side of that, that ends up being the thing that causes the schism between us all is when somebody from the outside, it's that thing of when somebody who is not black says, well, that's not black enough. Now my man over there, that's the black experience. Oh, she's a sister right there. That's a real sister. That's a real, I've had someone say, no, 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 no. That's a real black dude. What? How do you, Mark, what? To be honest I with you. Never, I, I, I would never do that to any other race to go, that's a real Asian right there. That's a real Latin person. That's a real this. It's not my place. It's not my place. You made me come to the realization that I was just, just like, I think that when I thought of, like, when you first hit me up, you feel me? I'm from Bryan, Texas, man. I'm from Bryan, Texas, small little town, you feel me? I grew up watching you on local news because we ain't had no cable, you know what I'm saying? So I come from that type of small town. But I'm thinking of when we start to look up to people in certain ways, we take their humanity away. You feel me? And I'm thinking of just as a as a as a millennial that watched Dave Chappelle's show that thought it was very funny, yo. Uh, but uh, Wayne Brady makes Brian Gumble look like Malcolm X. Like, ha ha, that's funny, that vanilla ass nigga, this, that, and the other. I'm not talking to you and seeing your face right now. I'm not, I never thought about how normalized, like Dave Chappelle was a popular show, man. It was a big ass popular show. So I can only imagine. People coming to you and thinking it's cool to be like, Wayne Brady's name man, black. This so so you know what I'm saying? I think that just 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 having this conversation right now is coming to the realization of that social media and media in general, outside of social media, when you see people on the screen, you tend to give them a godlike complex where you believe they ain't people no more and you can say whatever the hell you want to say. And I'm recognizing that now having a little platform in terms of, hey, I got feelings too, damn it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I got I got feelings and emotions too, man. Watch what you say to me. And I'm just recognizing now, Wayne, I can't imagine what you went through during Wayne during Chappelle's time. Well, thank, thank you for saying that. Thank you. Thanks. But here is the thing, and and that was a dual-edged sword because yeah, it sucked to have people to to this day think that it's funny to come up to me. But it, but in a loving way, they feel that I'm in on the joke. They're like, hey Wayne, you make ha and what I've had to do is the reason that God bless Dave Chappelle when he called me, because maybe not everyone watching is aware of the, the Chappelle sketch, but it's a, it's, it's actually in the TV museum uh, uh, as one of the top 10 sketches in comedic history because of the way that we, we wrote the hell out of that sketch. When Dave approached me and said, man, I'm sorry, Mooney wrote that. I would love it if oh, you would I come... Mooney, man come back and do this thing with me, right? So so when I decided to do that sketch with him, 
I never realized how it would blow up. So what I had to talk to people about is to tell people why, wait, I'm going to adjust my volume, make sure that volume, to, yeah, hey, to hey, tell is, people is, why. Is it live still or the conversation private? I don't see no comments, no number ain't moved. What's the comment? As long as no, it's live. I ain't tripping. No, it's live. Yeah, it's live. I don't see no yeah, comments. You disabled the, I don't see nothing. It's, it is, it's stuck at a number, and I see one comment. I ain't seen no more comments. No, and I'm seeing in. comments come through. Yeah. Ah, I'm about to say, mine is frozen, so we good. Yeah. yeah. Um, that why, this is why I had to break this down to people, why I felt the sketch that I did with Dave was funny. Here is why Paul Mooney's joke wasn't funny. And you, you in telling me about how you was a young person watching that at that time, this is why that joke isn't funny. For any type of humor to work, and I've had this conversation with my daughter now regarding um, Asian jokes or someone using an accent or all these things that are, Wait, I'm going to talk to this dude, Dabin20. See, this is the dude. He said, heck yeah, it blew up because we were used to you being this funny good guy and then you did an entire 180. That was some good acting. Dabin, this is for you and every other black person. Pay very close fucking attention. For humor to work, you are banking as a joke writer on a commonality of experience. So Paul Mooney, as a black person, in that one joke, looked at Brian Gumbel and said, Brian Gumbel isn't part of my black experience. So that's horrible. And then he looked at me and said, well, I'm going to use Brian Gumbel and weaponize that, that person and that type of person against this cat. So when you laugh at that joke, you're basically saying that Brian Gumbel, who went to whatever school he went to and rose up through the ranks, as hard as it is to become the top of his profession as a sportscaster in that day, especially a black dude. And me, I'm, you know what? I, I'm going to give myself roses. Look me up. See how many historic firsts I've made as an entertainer and a performer in this business. Nigga hit you with the Wayne Brady just hit you with the Google me, nigga. If you if you don't Google recognize that. that, he just told you to Google him. <laughs> so then he says, but that's not black. No matter what these two black people did, fuck that. Forget them, because that's not black. So when I hear that joke, there's no truth in it. Some someone says humor has truth, truth in it, little little mama stuff. No, there's no truth in that because you have dispelled the accomplishments. It's like when Bill Maher, I, I went after Bill, Bill Maher when Bill Maher said that, that I wish that President Obama would be less Wayne Brady and more Suge Knight. This white man is telling people that he wants the black dude to be more that way and not this way because that's good. You know what? I'm going to, this guy, Chris likes booty stroke. I'm going to delete that cat his okay. name chris like booty stroke man you let yeah. him comment away and run the algorithm up wayne brady i know you a yeah. little old school so let me put you on game how this social media shit work right when you get trolls you feel me i guess you already said but so you ain't tripping huh but listen the algorithm you know always like hey if a person has this much time to sit with you like this or whatever let them goddamn. You should let their ass come in away. You feel me? The well, conversation well, with them. Well, well, I let him. Well, I let him come come on back and come comment. Yeah, come in away. Let that live. Let it live. You know what I'm saying? We can fire his ass up, man. <laughs> I I think that we'll be getting. I think that more seriously though. A conversation about power and respectability politics is the conversation that I think that they were trying to have, and I think that the mm -hmm. way it was doing it is just created more anti-black violence against the black people they were trying to be critical with. And I think that that's something I had to learn, you feel me, growing up and going to a predominantly white school, being a first generation college student, my mom and my daddy being convicted felons and shit like that. I had to learn, you feel mm. me, that there are a lot of different experiences within the black community and how we come to affirm, I'm gonna use that word definitely, affirm. I like that. You feel like me? That. Different experiences. I think it's sometimes, I say some, most of the times, it justifies how we relate to it and how we value it. So I'm recognizing, you feel me, that from a certain standpoint, he was trying to be critical about how y'all get to navigate in terms of respectability politics and the privilege of being able to be seen as appealing. 
Because I had to recognize at a young age, I had to recognize when I went back to school, when I went back to the hood from being at University of Oklahoma, that a lot of my homeboys started doing certain shit to me. And I, and I recognized they already did shit to me because they recognized I had the privilege of being a magical Negro and being able to suit your <laughs> different white people's, what I'm going to call, they got down, what, what, what word I want to use? Suit your, their, uh, 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 like, I feel like they, they, they dispositions. You feel me? Like, I'm, yeah. I'm like, George Lee, you're not like those black people. You speak good. You feel me? I, I see how that was being critical of it. You see what I'm saying? But going back to your point, going back to your point, the issue becomes when those white people are able to double down on those backhanded anti-black compliments like X, Y, and Z, and then seeing how our intercommunal shit of this person said, Wayne Brady wasn't black enough. So now random non-black Idaho dude, Bob from Idaho now going to run into Wayne Brady and be like, you're not even black. Yes, absolutely. And that is a problem. And I'm not just saying it from my own personal experience because I happen to know what I've gone through and I happen to know where I'm from and I, and I happen to know my story. And we have millions and millions of stories like that. But if you leave it up to the media and if you leave it up to certain viewpoints, you will only think that, and if you watch the wrong sitcom, you will only think that we are a hardworking black family in Cincinnati, or we are a very upscale family in New York where both parents are doctors. There really can't be any in between or whatnot. You only get that, or you are the big black buck, or you're the effeminate um, gay second character. You don't get the full spectrum of who we are. That's the thing. That's the thing, and Davin, I see you. Thank you for giving me props on the sketch, but I was telling you why the joke that prompted the sketch wasn't funny because that joke is rooted in self-hate. Specifically, like, yeah, definitely. Anti-blackness and being able to marcate what black is and what black is not. I definitely, I made a debate career. You can, you can Google me on this one too, goddamn. Talk to me. Yes, I did. Yes, Listen, sir. White supremacy is always going to be predicated off of using black people as fungible objects. The way that white supremacy is able to use black people as fungible objects is they're able to already set up a limited positions of what we can become. When I was talking on what I'm saying to Father Wayne, Wayne was talking about when he first got into acting, how it was like, hey, you can either be the black person that's a nerd or the thug and literally made it where there's no in-between. I'm an individual that's I'm somewhere in between there, right? But we see the violence that creates that it makes it where we erase and or 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 or, or disvalidate everything in between. So when it comes to recognizing the multiplicity of blackness and black people, I'm gonna say we can, we can be critical about how one is able to be appealing and or able to be seduced by whiteness or white supremacy. But this does not mean you say that this person is not black enough. This does not mean that you get to, you know what I'm saying, uh, 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 try to take a person's personhood away from them based off of their racial ethnic identity. And I think that that's a part of this conversation that I feel like has to be had. It's how, mm. how in our community do we be critical with each other when it comes to talking about power and privilege and how power and privilege operates inside of our community, especially you and I as black men. You feel me? And I think that's the reason why I want to have this conversation. I know we're supposed to talk about digital red line. We can have that conversation. You know what I'm saying? But I think that this one about healing, about pain, about trauma, especially two black men being real with each other, I think that's a real conversation the world needs to see. You feel me? Well, we have to have this talk about pain and trauma because when we can deal with our pain as men and as black men, and this is what I'm trying to learn, and I wish I would have learned this earlier, from, from raising this beautiful daughter who is, who, who is multiracial, but when, when you look at her and whatnot, she identifies as black and she identifies as Asian. The, the, the trauma that I have, I needed to deal with that trauma so that I can handle being out in the world and, and I can handle not having this anger and I can handle talking to her about certain things. Because even at a young age, she, she, she would look at me and she's like, dad, sometimes you're different than you are on TV. And you're smiling there, but you're not smiling there. And I realized the more that I smile, and Dave even spoke on this, when certain jokes that he said, he stopped doing the show when he felt that certain people were laughing at the jokes louder than other people. That when I realized that there was a 
a dichotomy with me that I was this way in public and this way at home because I'm so mad at how I feel like I'm being looked at in public. I needed to start doing that trauma work. If I can fix this, if I can make myself, and I'm admitting to you people, and I admit this on all sort of podcasts and shows and whatnot, I'm, I'm trying to talk to the mental health issue in the black community because I need that work. If I can deal with myself, that, then I can be a better man to my daughter. Then I can be a better partner to my best friend, Mandy, who I, I realized that when I was married, I, I could have been a better husband, but I wasn't ready to be a better man. So I, I, had, I had all this anger and inter internalized stuff. I can be a better boyfriend. I can be a better actor. I, 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 I can be a better son. We need to help ourselves. Man, you, uh, man. Hmm. Man, I think that a lot of times we have a fake facade of ourselves that we want to present and it causes us to not be real with who we really are. And I think that what you just touched on, man, I feel like in the age that we live in, in our reality of social media and everybody want to acknowledge their accomplishments and everybody want to talk about the great things they did in life and shit like that, but never kind of get to the ugly, to, to the ugly part, it makes it where kids that's growing up in this age, they don't get to recognize the full totality of the human experience in terms of, hey, you know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. what you hit on, the reason why it hit me like that, because my wife got on me like, damn, man. So... When you're doing your thing, you they get the good George. They get the happy this, that, and the other. But when you come home, you, you act like you ain't in the mood to be around us or something like this. And we getting tired of that. Like, I'm, I'm saying, I, I, I'm happy for you. You you, you happy on saying your platform doing this and doing that. But I don't think it's fair that them people out there get the best consciously and you come home and you tired in a bad mood, George. You feel me? And I think wow. that the, 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 the mental health part of that is me recognizing that Stacey Patton quote is that at home, I get to feel like I get to I get to, I get to be upset when I can be upset. As a black man that's trying to build something, I recognize how my pain and my feelings and my emotions get weaponized against me that can further pathologize me. Motherfuckers already call me race hustler and victimization and this, that, and the other. You feel what I'm saying? It's like I don't want to deal with that. So I'm a I'm a, I'm a, I'm a word of mask, like let's talk about. It. And then I get home. man. A lot of pain, a lot of uh, a lot of healing has to take place for us being real with ourselves. My grandfather used to always say, in order for you to keep it real with yourself, I mean, in order to keep it real with somebody else, you got to keep it real with yourself. And my grandfather used to also say something like, hey, the pathway to hell is paved with good intentions. A lot of us have good intentions in keeping our hurt and our pain away from the, uh, away from the light. You feel me? But like that quote say, you can end yourself in hell even though you have great motive and great intentions behind what you're doing. And I feel like what I've learned from social media, from what I've learned from being on social media and thinking more deeply about my mental health and going to therapy, I'm going to start going a lot more, is the virtual world, the material world, and how a lot of the times there is not a way for you to stand. You feel me? It's times, mm. man, I went to sleep and goddamn, that one negative comment is what stayed on my temple. Bro, I'm talking about I have a post that blew up that got a million views. It got 10,000 comments. But damn it, it was these two negative comments that just blew my mind. Everybody told me I was brilliant, I was smart, I was intelligent. It was these two comments, though, that just really, and I'm seeing my psychology always, I feel like all, all of us kind of want to focus on negative shit and then make it where we ignore all the beauty and stuff. You feel me? And I just, what you're hitting on, man, I, I, I feel like now I'm ranting because my mind is racing. And you just, man, you... Uh, man, shout out to, to my partner and my, and, my, and my kids, man. And you know what I mean? Shout out to Wayne, definitely. You feel me? I just had an epiphany. And yeah, man. Yeah. You just made me so... Uh, I had to internalize this for a second because I've never really put it the way that you just put it from that quote about the world gets your best and we get the rest. And I have to be honest with you right now, I am so sad that my daughter's whole childhood, and I know that I'm a good dad, man. If it's one thing that I've tried to do in this world, it's to be the father that I didn't necessarily have. Yeah. But 
to think that all these years when I would come home and feel this and I would and I would never yell at her, but kids can feel things or Damn to my right partner or to my partner when, when I was married to her or or to anyone that I'm seeing or to my girl to know that I have been complicit in that in that robbery, I feel that there's a little bit of robbery that they should have been able to have the best possible version of uh, of me of us instead of leaving it as you know as we call it as per performers you know leaving it on the stage and making all these people happy. I love doing that, but I love my family more, and it hurts me that. I wasn't able to give them all of me because I did not know how to free it up. And that yeah. makes me so sad. But I, I, this, 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 this piece that we're on right now is a part of this conversation of intercommunal violence because how we feel when we go home, how our heart and our mind and our feelings and our emotions is, how it is when we go home, it matters. And the reason why I was so moved by the the the, the that, that, that 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 video I do edit of the black dude talking to quote unquote the black nerds is because he was acknowledging some some shit that, that was going on inside of our community. And I think that what Wayne hitting on, what I'm hitting on, what I'm getting at is that what we do at home, I mean, what we do at work, what we do in the streets, contrary to popular belief, it always makes its way back home. The question is how mm. you deal with it. A lot of us want to ignore the shit that we go through. In this. I feel like I was I was raised, my father, you feel me, was a street dude. You feel me? And him being a street dude, I recognize now as, as, as an adult that he went through a lot of shit in the streets from the police, his own community, his baby mama. I, all, I recognize that. But a lot of times when he came home to be with the kids or to be father, you feel me, how he dealt with the shit that he dealt with in the streets or his lack thereof, the kids in the home was the first the better part of the impact. So the reason mm. why it's important for us to have this conversation about what happens inside of our community, because a lot of us really ignore or we don't know what we don't know in terms of, hey, man, you, you hurt people around you. You feel me? And the reason why I want to have this conversation is because I recognize that in our community, there's a lot of ways in which we have rationalized and justified being hurtful to each other. Wow. And that's just being real. I, I recognize that. And I know that it's hard for us to have these conversations because we get made non-human by the world. The world will say, as soon as we get busted in the mouth by somebody else, they bring up black on black crime. So we feel like we want to talk about what black people do to black people, we get pathologized. You feel what I'm saying? And it's like, I, I recognize that in terms of, hey, man, it's no such thing as black on black crime. It's crime. Studies show that shit. If you poor and you live in the hood, you ain't going to go to the other side of town to commit a crime. You're going to commit a crime next to your neighbor. You feel what I'm saying? And, but we know that when it comes to we get racialized, we get pathologized in ways that make it where we cannot have this conversation. Black person, you hurt me. I'm black. You my brother. I'm your brother. But you hurt me. Sister, I love you to death. This, that, and the other. But you hurt me. Um, I'm sorry that I treat other people this way, that align this way, but you remind me of this my mama, this, that, and the other. And I'm not trying to take out my pain and my trauma that I have my mother against you, black woman, but I see my mother. I, we, I'm, not, I'm not justifying nothing. I'm acknowledging this real reality that we got to work through. You feel me? My, I feel like part of my idea and my platform of being more public is having these crucial, hard conversations that nobody want to have and being able to take them with tenacity and realness and genuineness that everybody can relate to and to be able to recognize we got a lot of work to do. You feel me? It's easy to point out there. The bad folks out there, it's out there. A lot of times it's hard for us to think about the inside the home, inside the community work. White folks, non-black people, it's not for y'all to go back and edit this video and try to play it on Fox News and shit like that and play us. You feel me? But if you do it, prove our point, I guess. But it's for us to be able to heal. All humans want to heal. And the healing can't start without a conversation. That's the thing, is there just needs to be a conversation. So one-on-ones like this, I feel, blow up into to pods of people talking. If, if somebody else 
uh, you know, looks at it and says, hey, hey, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it at another time. And, and if it frees up one cat watching right now, if it frees somebody up, then we would have done, done our job. Yeah, man. And, and something that you did, too, that was powerful on here is that that Stacey, the Dr. Stacey Patton quote hit me so hard because I know how conditioned we are to not want to show our, our feelings and our emotions publicly. I feel like as a as a as a as a, a black man of your stature, I feel like showing your I feel like expressing yourself in that way. I feel like it's very liberating for me as a younger black man. You feel me? That's watching it. And I think that to other people watching it, I feel like it's even not black men. It might be, I feel like, liberating and or just mind-blowing to see black us as black men, I feel like, be represented and or act in a different way on this public platform. Because a lot of times we don't see black men cry. You feel me? And it's crazy that I was having this conversation. When you called me a few minutes when we had this conversation, I was mm -hmm. having this TikTok Live situation with therapists and shit, we both damn near cry because we recognize how much trauma and pain and hurt that's around this very complex situation of being accepted or not accepted by your other people because you said it when you're other inside of a group that's already other it's so deep it is so deep because if you're all other and you're looking for Because the mainstream or whatever is looked at as the baseline says that you are an other. To be this much more distant from that baseline and to not have a connection with your group, it's not just lonely isn't even the word. It's fundamentally damaging to your psyche and to who you are. And that's why this trauma work has to happen because anything that you have, you want to get your car fixed, you wouldn't drive around if your car was missing a tire and making a weird noise and you wouldn't live in your house if half of it was gone. And you, so why not work on this? And I say that as somebody who I do very imperfect work on working on myself in stops and starts because sometimes it gets too real and too hard. And I go, you know what? I don't need to go to that therapist anymore. I don't need to do this because I don't need to deal with it, blah, 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 blah. Well, my aim is to do as much work as I can before I leave this planet and to just see. Let's just see what would it be like if we put in the work? What, what if we all put in the work in individually? The sky's the limit, man. The sky's the limit. In my opinion, uh, a lot of... A lot of my politics orient around political, social, and economic independence for Black people. Black people being able to determine our own destinies for ourselves, right? What does that look like? For me, that starts at the very home base in terms of being reflective and re being able to work through the way that power and oppression has made us look at ourselves crazy and look at other people that look like us crazy and or do things to them, you feel me? And I think that when you think about political, social, economic, you feel me? Independence or black people being able to decide those things. You have to start to get, you have to one way or another start with mental health and how literally there are different capacities or different abilities that people think that we have or don't have. You feel me? Especially when we talk about disability in, in the black, I'm saying the black community. When we think about mm. who has access to what, who has resources to what. You feel me? Goddamn, Instagram is a is a is, is a it's a global app. There's no reason why Instagram should make it where the, it should already be a goddamn subtitle, closed captions right there, trying to keep up with my country fast talking ass right now. But it's not. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Thinking mm -hmm. about what does it do for the black people to have a harder hearing? This conversation was a real conversation. They should be a part of it. But thinking about how inside of our community how we relate to other people in the community and how, no matter how woke or conscious we claim to be, how we can get in the way of other people's shit, right? Like, I, I think I'm for women's progression, but I think I'd be a fool if I couldn't recognize the ways in which I get in the way of women's progression, especially black women. But you see how it's, I feel like there's, there's, a, there's a tie your shoes and chew gum at the same time reflectiveness that has to happen, and I think that... A
LGBT community or things like that, we don't have the reflexivity that says that, hey, even though you for this thing and you think it's good, you should also be reflective and critical about how you can fuck up this thing that black community is that. I, I hope I ain't break up, but for me, the black community is that. Like, we gotta, a lot of us care about the black community. We love the black community. We want the black community to heal. The main thing you take from this conversation is, what are you doing that gets in the way of the black community healing? Consciously mm. trying to do the work. Sound like Wayne Brady's trying to do the work. What are the work that you're doing in terms of how are you getting in the way of political, social, economic progression of black people? Even if you black. Matter of fact, especially if you black. Because we can get in our own way. That's a, that's a, yeah, we can definitely get in our own way. But, the, but, but that's a beautiful question. What are you doing to, that puts you in the way of progress? And the flip side, what are you doing to help? And are you even interested in, in helping? Because there's, because there's the other person, and um, I've got to hop off real, real, real uh, yeah, fast. Yeah. But, but like there, there's the other person, and I'm not going to throw anybody under the bus and name names right now. But there's a certain type of influencer on TikTok and Instagram, and I've seen this person. I don't necessarily interact with people like this, but I know that, that I'm watching Mandy, you know, my partner, I'm watching her grow her, her platform and people that she's come into con contact with. And every blue moon, I spot somebody who they love the dance, they love the trends, they'll do the whole thing. Hey, 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 we fam, we fam. Hey, can you amplify this voice and help us get this thing out? Oh, um yeah i don't know can we do the choreography can i do the this channel no can you help me amplify a voice can you be anti-racist not just saying that i'm not racist isn't good enough and there are those voices that stand in the way because they have platforms and they take up the culture, they take up things on social media, they take up these trends, they take up these things that are black owned and Asian owned and Latin owned and have the spice, but they refuse to be part of the fight. I'm not gonna name you right now, but I feel that you know who you are. You know who you are, only your head dog holler too. You know what I'm saying? If you hollering right now, arr, 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 you probably need to go get the step checked out because this, this message applies to you. If it don't apply though, and let it fly. We don't want to hear. We don't want to hear none of your weak ass uh, uh, arguments in the comment section. Nothing like that. if it don't apply, let it fly. But I know where I'm from. We always say, man, if the world loved the black community, I mean the black culture as much as it loved, you know what I'm saying, black community. If the world loved black people as much as it loved black culture, we'd be in a better place. Me being from Texas, I always think about this too. If the world loved Mexican identity as much as it loved Mexican food. It'd be, I think there's a lot of things that happens in America where we're able to separate a people from its culture. Well, we can taco Tuesday your ass to death and then criminalize your ass on Thursday. You feel me? Well, we can goddamn celebrate you and your sports and your talk and your dances on this day, but then on this day, even if you did, we're going to drag you through the mud. I think there's cultural a lot cherry that picking. To It's cultural cherry picking. Taking the parts that you enjoy. Mm. This tastes good, but let's get rid of that piece of it. Uh, hey, 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 hey. You know what, though? Because you know what, Brian? I, I feel like I, I'm always, I was taught, I know, know y'all leave. I'm, I'm going to say two last things. I'm going to talk, I was taught to you how to take the opportunities, man. The first thing, TikTok, man, I know y'all know Wayne Brady is and this, that, and the other. If you listen to TikTok, can we have a conversation specifically about what we're talking about in terms of how it impacts content creators of color? Specifically, when we start talking about uh, how how apps are are, 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 are are energized with different trends, how a lot of those trends are usually very ethnic. But you don't want to deal with the reality of where these ethnic culture trends come from. You feel me? I can't say nigga on TikTok. TikTok gives 70, 60% of the content it gives us is nigga skits, nigga songs, all that. It's a problem when you want to be able to use and celebrate the black culture, but you don't want to deal with the black reality that creates the culture and so forth and so on. The second thing, the second thing, the second thing, and the last thing, Miss Candace Owens, um, I don't agree with a lot of the things you say, but I do disagree with anybody, especially, I ain't gonna say anybody, I disagree with the nine black people that call you coon and that call you Uncle Tom and they make and, and, and they try to talk shit about your, you know what I'm saying, blackness, especially when white liberals do it. My forward challenge advance to you. I've heard you make a lot of comments and videos about you not being able to talk to somebody that has the facts. 
I believe I have the facts and we can have a great conversation about police brutality. We can have a conversation about black fatherhood. We can have a conversation about whatever you want to have a conversation about. Um, consciously, georgeleespeaks.com is where you can find it at. But I'm open to having this conversation with you, Candace Owens. And if you're somebody that has uh, uh, contact with her camp, consciously think that we can have a great political conversation pertaining to, to black people on plantation. I want to hear that conversation. I want to hear that conversation. I appreciate you. I thank you so, 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 so much, Grant Wayne Brady, for giving me this opportunity and sharing your platform, amplifying this voice, man. To no, all you, the, man. The thank you. Out there, healing. It's time to heal. Black men specifically, let's own our shit, you feel me? And, and own our shit in ways where we being real to ourselves about our, our feelings and our emotions. You feel me? We got to be able let's to talk together. about our pain and our feelings and our emotions outside of when homie get killed. Outside of when ops ride, riding the bike, uh, spinning the block. Outside of when, you feel me, the other pain and trauma that we don't talk about. Let's get to that shit. Man, thank you so much, brother. You, um, I look forward to us getting together and really, really talking, man. Oh, yeah. So, oh, yeah. yeah. I know it's coming, Wayne. Definitely. It's coming for sure, man. appreciate you again. I know you got something to do. Yeah, I'm going to shoot you a text. Okay, bet. Thank, thank you. And thank you, everyone, for watching. And thank you from the bottom of our hearts for, for listening. All right, y'all. All right. Bye.